Just some key points to, uh, you know, why, why is local fish important? Why is our Wisconsin local fish important? Um, first of all, it supports our local economy. Our local producers live here in Wisconsin. They're employing Wisconsin people. So when we buy, when we purchase Wisconsin fish, we're supporting those local businesses in our state. Uh, local protection as well. Um, our fish in both the Great Lakes and our, our Wisconsin fish farms are regulated by both the federal government and our own state government. So we have a stake in that protection of those water resources. Um, it's, our, it's much, much different than the fish that's coming from abroad. Um, that's a whole different story. But the fish from here in the U.S. and in our state are regulated by our laws. And uh, uh, I would also say that um, Eating local fish also gives people kind of that connection that I was talking about to their local water resources. And I think that's an important thing for all of us. Our Wisconsin water resources belong to all of us. So when you connect to those local resources, if you go fishing, you go swimming, if you eat the fish that, come from, that comes from that water, that gives you a connection that's really difficult to get any other way. So I would just throw out those three key points there about our local fish. Um, uh, Emma talked a little bit about our Wisconsin farm-raised fish. A lot of people have questions about, well, what, what are our local fish eating? Uh, Wisconsin farm-raised fish, she said, are eating feeds that are regulated by the FDA. Those feeds are being tested. Um, fish as a protein source has a little different thing going on than uh, cattle or, or poultry. Um, fish live in water, and water is a different sort of uh, uh, chemical environment than <laughs> land-based protein sources. So uh, Megan Williams from the Wisconsin DNR is going to be here uh, talking next to talk about uh, contaminants in Great Lakes fish. Um, it's something that we wish we didn't have to talk about, but she's going to let us know why we are talking about it. Um, it's a legacy uh, for our Great Lakes, a legacy that we're hoping to put in the past, um, and things are getting better, but I will let our expert, Megan, talk about uh, Great Lakes fish. <coughs> Before I get started with my presentation, I'm going to pass out some booklets that are called Choose Wisely. Oh, Kathy will do it for me. Sure. Um, this is available online too, so if you don't want to take it with you, that's fine. I'll just collect them so that they don't go in the trash or the recycling. Um, but we'll be looking through this book in a minute. Um, so like Kathy said, my name is Megan Williams and I'm an environmental toxicologist in fisheries at the um, DNR. So today I'm going to talk about the benefits of fishing in Wisconsin and eating Wisconsin fish. Then I'll talk about what types of contaminants we find in Wisconsin fish, what they are, where they come from, how they get into the fish, what they might do to you. Um, talk about some efforts that we have to monitor and reduce the contaminants that are found in the Great Lakes including our very own fish contaminant monitoring program that I um, help with at the DNR. And then I'm going to give you a lot of information to help you safely eat your catch or the catch that you're providing to your consumers, including choosing which fish to eat, um, from which locations, and then some tips on how to cook, clean, and eat your fish um, sort of in a safe way. So as everyone here knows, fishing is a really great Wisconsin tradition. It's accessible to lots of people. You can do it pretty much anywhere in the state because we're so rich in water resources. It's a great way to spend time with your family or spend time by yourself, which I know is a way that a lot of people prefer to fish. And also, eating Wisconsin fish is another great tradition. Whether it's a fish boil, fish fry, or some smoked white fish, it's pretty much in the DNA of people who live here. So there are a lot of benefits to eating Wisconsin fish, aside from um, supporting the local economy. As Kathy was mentioning earlier, it's a really great source of lean protein, and it's also a really good source of omega-3 fatty acids. So one thing you might not actually know about omega-3s is that humans or vertebrates in general, um, actually we can't produce those naturally in our bodies. We have to get them from our diet. And there are a couple different types of omega-3 fatty acids. There's short-chain um, fatty acids, which um, you might see as called ALA. And those are the ones that are found in different types of oils, nuts, and you might see them um, on some containers of eggs that you get at the store. 
And then we have our long chain omega-3 fatty acids, which are the super beneficial ones, and those are mainly just found in seafood. Long chain omega-3s um, are often known as EPA and DHA, and they're really good for reducing inflammation in the body, which is really helpful for heart health. And they are absolutely vital to brain and eye development, particularly in babies and young children. So this figure is kind of crazy. I'm aware of that. Um, it basically shows the amount of EPA and DHA that we've measured in an 8-ounce uncooked serving of all these different types of fish that we caught from the Great Lakes. And what I really want you to focus on here is this orange line. This is what's known as the acceptable intake level of EPA and DHA. It's the minimum recommended daily amount for healthy adults. And as you can see, which is awesome news, an eight ounce serving of almost every fish that we um, have caught so far from the Great Lakes will provide you or your consumers with at least 250 milligrams of EPA and DHA. So this is really good news. <coughs> Of course, uh, with many things in life, whether it's having a beer or having a fish meal, there are risks and benefits to consider. So in the 70s, um, people started to notice that there was a lot of mercury in the fish and started to be kind of concerned about this. Um, mercury is actually a naturally occurring element in the world. Um, it can be sort of dispersed into the air when volcanoes erupt or when there are forest fires, but it also is released into the air in much larger quantities when there's industrial processes like um, coal-fired power plants or mining operations. And because it's released into the air, it can actually travel a really long distance from its original source. So even if there's not a lot of um, emissions right around your water body, it still means that there might be mercury in the lake because it came there on the air. When mercury goes into a water body, it goes into the sediments and um, bacteria that live in the sediment sort of munch on it and naturally um, convert it into its toxic form, which is known as methylmercury. And mercury is actually found in all fish, um, no matter where you get it from. It's just a natural, mm, sort of natural part of um, fish. But in Wisconsin, um, mercury is found in the highest concentrations in some northern lakes. So another thing about mercury is that it bioaccumulates, which means it travels um, up the food chain in higher and higher concentrations. So we see in this little figure, we have mercury, methylmercury, it goes into the water. Um, low concentrations are found in invertebrates, um, panfish, inland trout, things that eat those invertebrates. Then medium amounts are found in smaller or younger um, predator fish species. And then higher concentrations are found in larger or older predator fish species like walleye, pike, and muskie. Um, mercury is found in the muscle tissue of fish. So keep that in mind and we'll come back to it. Um, something that is possibly more relevant to today is um, a class of chemicals called poly polychlorinated biphenyls or PCDs. These are a group of man-made compounds, and they are engineered to be resistant to breakdown, which means that they last for a really long time in the environment. A lot of production happened from the 1920s till the late 1970s when they were banned, and they were used in a lot of um, manufacturing processes, including um, carbonless copy paper, which is um, relevant to Wisconsin in particular. And unlike uh, mercury, which is found pretty much across the whole state, in Wisconsin, PCBs are most often associated with industrialized river systems and the Great Lakes. And this is because um, PCB-containing fluids were sometimes, so this is not happening now, but in the past, sometimes just discharged right into the water body, like right from a pipe. Um, but sometimes um, there was a storm, and then stormwater runoff would sort of wash these PCBs into the water and they would accumulate in the sediments. So compared to mercury, PCBs actually accumulate in the fat of fish. So that means that fattier species tend to have higher concentrations than leaner, leaner species. 
And then fish that live near the bottom of the water bodies have more than um, those that live higher in the water column because they're closer to that source. So you might wonder, what's the big deal? Um, mercury is actually um, what's known as a neurodevelopmental toxin. So if you have too high of that in your body, you'll have some problems with memory, learning, and your coordination. More recently, it has been linked to heart disease in older men, but really the highest risk we feel is to women who currently are or plan to become pregnant, and also um, young children. Because this is a neurodevelopmental toxin, it affects um, the way the brain is growing. PCBs, on the other hand, are a class of chemicals called endocrine disruptors. And this means that they can kind of mess up your reproductive systems and give you problems with your thyroid, which um, controls a lot of different things in your body. And so a high concentration of PCBs in your body is um, linked to an increased risk of cancer and diabetes or some immune system problems. And compared to mercury, PCBs are a risk for everyone, regardless of your gender or how old you are. So I've told you all this bad stuff. You're kind of wondering, like, what are people doing about this? As you may imagine, there are a lot of collaborative efforts um, internationally, federally, locally to monitor and reduce contamination in, um, in Great Lakes fish. So it started with the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement in 1978. More recently, we've got the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And um, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and Department of Health Services are part of this Great Lakes Consortium for Fish Consumption Advisories. It's a collaboration for, um, with all these people down here, or I should say people from all of these organizations down here. Um, natural resources professionals, water quality professionals, public health professionals. We get together, share information on contaminants or lack of contaminants that we're measuring in the fish from the Great Lakes. We evaluate um, what the effects might be on people who are eating these fish. And then we use that information to develop standardized advice for um, eating fish from all the Great Lakes. So if you go fishing in Lake Lake Michigan and you come home to Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, or Michigan, you'll be receiving the same information about eating those fish regardless of where you go. So we're really trying to reduce the amount of confusion that's going on. So you might wonder, is this working? Well, Environment Canada and the US EPA have been measuring levels of PCBs in lake trout since the mid-1970s, and they have seen significant decreases in the concentrations that they've seen through time. So this is really good news. Um, in terms of Wisconsin DNR's fish contaminant monitoring program, we've also been looking at contaminants in fish since the 1970s. Our program focuses on popular lakes and rivers that get a lot of fishing pressure, as well as waters that are near industrial centers to try to capture the whole picture. Um, so this little map shows um, water bodies where we've collected fish for testing. So we've gotten over 1,700 sites um, in Wisconsin so far. And the really good news is, you know, we have 115,000 lakes, 84,000 river miles, and of all those water resources in Wisconsin, we only have less than 150 waters that have exceptions to our general advice because there's elevated mercury or PCB. So that's really good news. So in this graph or map, we have um, the green waters are ones where we see higher amounts of PCBs. So you see a lot of our industrialized river systems in the Great Lakes. Mercury, um, where we have special advice, is up here mostly with um, the northern lakes. But you can also see there's a ton of light blue on this map, which represents waters where we don't have special regulations or advice. So it's really good news, and it's you know reduced every year, or it has reduced through time, I shouldn't say, every single year. But we also have been um, doing some data analysis on PCBs in fish from the Great Lakes. These show um, Chinook and Coho from Lake Michigan. We have looked, um, we have seen that there is a pretty sharp decrease in PCB concentrations between the mid-1970s and mid-1980s. 
and there's still a decrease from the mid-1980s until now, but it's just a little less, and we think that's because, you know, there's less PCBs there to begin with, so it's decreasing at a lower rate. So this is all good news. I don't want to forget to um, mention the Department of Health Services. They're a really important part of our program, and they focus sort of on the other side of the fillet. <laughs> Um, so they're looking at fish consumers. So they're monitoring um, and assessing fish consumption patterns, um, how people are being affected or not affected by um, contaminants that may or may not be in the fish they're eating. I would be really happy to talk to anyone about these studies that I have sort of detailed here later, but I don't have time to get into them now, but I just wanted to give a shout out to Department of Health Services because they're really important. So after all this information, you might be wondering, how can I eat fish? You know, <laughs> what can I do? It's obviously not as easy as this. If it was, that would be great. I would also be out of a job, but it would be great. Um, one of the big things that you can do is use the publications that we have um, put out. So what I passed out, or Kathy passed out, was this Choose Wisely booklet. We put this out every single year. We also have um, a cookbook where we solicited um, recipes from the general public, so what people in Wisconsin, how they eat their fish. It covers everything from burbot to walleye. Um, we really do have a lot. There's a recipe in there that suggests taking your sturgeon to a self car wash to sort of wash it off first. It's really a very unique cookbook. I have a couple copies of that. It's also available online, so if you'd like a paper copy, you can come talk to me. And then we also have this Wisconsin Wild Card, which just has our general statewide advice for most inland waters. So, if you open up your Choose Wisely book on page five at the very beginning, we have a guide for, per, for purchased fish. And this is basically, we took this directly from the FDA and EPA. We want to be able to provide people with information for eating fish that they might get at a store or restaurant. But more importantly for today, if you go to pages 8 and 9, we have advice for eating fish from Green Bay, Lake Michigan, and Lake Superior. So you'll notice for these tables, our guidelines are for everyone because the concern, um, the contaminant of concern in the Great Lakes is PCBs. You'll also notice for some species, um, they fall into a different advice category based on their size, but for some, it's just all sizes. So I have um, a little table here that shows advice that we have for commercially caught fish species. You'll notice there are a lot of different options, so you could eat up to one meal a week and up to one meal a month of a lot of different fish species that are caught, um, commercially caught in Wisconsin. We even have um, some fish that have such low contaminants and high um, fatty acids from Lake Superior that you can eat them sort of on an unrestricted basis. So it's good news, there's the silver lining. Another really important thing that you can do to reduce the amount of contaminants that are in your fish is clean and cook, um, sort of in a smart way. So, like I was saying before, mercury is found in the muscle tissue of fish, and PCBs are found in the fats. So, heat and cooking don't in themselves get rid of any of the contaminants, but it's the way that you prepare the fish before you cook it, and, the way, and how frequently you eat it, that really um, helps reduce the risk. So um, to get rid of the fat, you'd want to remove the skin and the fatty parts, so these sort of dark areas along the belly and sides and top of the fish. And then use a cooking method, which will allow the excess fat to drip away, like grilling or broiling. And then it goes without saying to not use those drippings to prepare the sauces or gravies. And mercury, um, since it's in the fish muscle tissue, you really can't clean the fish in a way that gets rid of it, but if you eat sort of low mercury fish or space out your fish meals, your body will actually naturally rid itself of mercury. So you can um, eat, you can still eat the fish, but just at a reduced frequency and then you don't have as much mercury. 
For people here who will be providing information to your customers, you know, when someone comes into your restaurant or fish market, they're an adult. They can make their own decisions. It's not your responsibility to tell them what they should and shouldn't be eating. Um, but the big thing to do is really know your fish, what species it is, where it came from. And for those that we have advice based on the size, know what the size of the fish is. If people want more information, you can suggest resources to them. So we have, um, at the DNR, we have a really nice website that's mobile friendly so people can use their phone. It's called Eating Your Catch. Um, the FDA and EPA have really good resources for seafood. Um, and when I was preparing for this talk, I found this Seafood Watch app from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, I, I don't know if there are other apps like that, but it would be useful, you know, to just look in, on the internet and see if there are other resources out there. And then, of course, prepare the fish that you're providing to reduce the contaminants whenever it's possible. So if you want more information, you can go to our website and do a search for Eating Your Catch, and it will have a lot of um, links to our publications, reports that we've put out, um, frequently asked questions. We also have a mobile-friendly um, interactive query tool. So you can use the drop-down menu or the map. You basically just click anywhere on the map, any water on the state, and it will give you um, fish consumption advice based on that water body. So if, it, if it's a water body you click on that doesn't have elevated, we haven't measured elevated levels of contaminants in those fish, it will just sort of give you our general guidelines for eating fish. So it's really useful if you are going fishing somewhere you've never been before or whatever. So in summary, like I said before, as with most things in life, there are benefits and risks to consider, um, including when you're eating fish, including when you're eating Wisconsin fish. Um, the Department of Health Services and Department of Natural Resources, our goal in all of this is to help people keep eating Wisconsin fish. So we provide a lot of resources for people to make informed decisions um, about eating Wisconsin fish. And, you know, you can safely incorporate them into your diet by following the advisories, cooking and cleaning smartly. So it's good news in the end. Um, so I want to say thanks for letting me come up here and talk to you about all of this stuff. Um, my contact information is at the bottom of the screen, and I think I have a couple minutes to answer questions if any of you have them, or you can come find me later. So thank you. Everybody doesn't realize that all seafood worldwide does have some amount of mercury in it. That's just a fact of life. So I always tell people, um, especially women of childbearing age or, you know, worried about their kids or something, the, the fish in Wisconsin, um, you know, we just learned it's, it's, been, uh, it's been checked and studied fairly, fairly <laughs> uh, a whole lot since the 1970s. So I... I feel very confident eating Wisconsin fish because we've been keeping a close eye on it for several, several decades um, compared to the fish that we might be purchasing from Thailand um, that, that, that people just aren't keeping an eye on that fish coming from abroad as closely as our Great Lakes fish have been monitored. So uh, I think that you can feel very confident if you're worried about contaminants, if you're following the advice by the DNR and the Department of Health Services, you really don't have anything to worry about because they've been, um, those are very, very uh, uh, restrictive. I, I, they're looking out for children and women of childbearing age. So that's what I always like to point out. Um, so we're talking about Wisconsin fish today, but we did decide to invite somebody from Michigan. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a Packer fan. <laughs> Um, I attended the Michigan Seafood Summit last year, so it was the first annual Michigan Seafood Summit. So we're coming to this a little late, um, but uh, we've invited Ron Kinyon in from Michigan Sea Grant to come talk to us about, uh, Ron's been working on uh, whitefish marketing for 
quite a, I mean, right. decades? Through my whole career. Through your whole career. <laughs> so, you know, we're not the first ones to jump on the local fish bandwagon, and uh, Michigan's been doing quite a bit. They're our neighbor. We're sharing some water with them, so uh, we want to hear what's been going on in Michigan. They're actually going to be hosting their next summit in April, right? April 8th in Traverse City, yep. Yep. So, uh, take it away, Ron. Okay, thanks, Kathy. Okay, I'm going to talk to you uh, about a marketing project we did with Great Lakes Whitefish. Uh, we had funding uh, through the National Sea Grant Program, and these are some of the colleagues from Michigan Sea Grant that worked with me on the project. This was several years back. And again, everybody, I think Titus covered a lot of this thing. It's a very important cold water fish species in the Great Lakes. Uh, it's one of our most uh, caught fish in the upper Great Lakes. Uh, you can see here, if you look at the yield from the Great Lakes, and again, this is some data I put together just before we got our marketing study put together, and you can see that at that time, Lake Huron is by far the biggest production, producer of uh, Lake Whitefish, followed by Lake Michigan, and then Lake Superior. A lot of people think Lake Superior is our biggest, it's a big lake, but it's not. It's not a very productive lake, so we don't get the catches we see in these, uh, like Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. And again, just to show you some perspective here, you can see that uh, there were some large harvests like back in 1988, 1998, 25 million pounds, dockside value of $20 million. Uh, again, at that time, the highest price was uh, about 90 cents per pound. That was the dockside value. And that's why we started this project because a lot of the fishermen were concerned about low prices on the dockside value. And in recent years, that dockside values have actually sometimes exceeded two dollars almost three dollars depending on the demand for that fish so the value has actually gone up in recent years since we've been involved and you can see we have both uh, uh, you can see the values here and also the the catches so and again if we look at uh, the yield in u.s value uh, the u.s basically harvested uh, in, in 1996 which is a peak then it was 13 million pounds dollar value of a dollar four per pound, that was in 2000. Canadian harvest was 12 million pounds, that was in 98, 2000. Peak value of 84 cents per pound in 2003. And Titus showed some of this in, the, in recent years that there has actually been some decline in harvest and Titus covered that. There's been a lot of issues with invasive species, especially the zebra and quagga mussel, which actually has hurt the food supply for whitefish, the disappearance of a major food source, diapariahs almost disappeared in Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. So that has affected whitefish, even uh, growth at age has decreased. Uh, so there's been a lot of issues with uh, the growth of that fish. And again, you can look at the harvest, it's about half and half between the US and, and Canada. And again, I don't have to go into this, Titus covered it very well. These are trap nets and then we also have gill nets. These are the major uh, fisheries we have in the Great Lakes for, uh, for harvesting whitefish. Some of the marketing needs that we looked at when we got into this pro project is increase uh, product identification and consumer awareness. And we've been talking about people want to buy local foods, they want to know where their food comes from. We want to improve quality control and product consistency. So there's a lot of moving parts in this project. We actually even had a guy come down from Alaska that uh, did a lot of work with the Alaska industry and we looked at a lot of stuff. Uh, he's written books on freezer, freezer, how to freeze these fish. A lot of stuff we didn't even think about, how fish go through rigor, rigor mortis, when do you freeze that fish. A lot of people don't even think about this. People have written books on this stuff, so it's very important when you get into this stuff. If you're going to get into freezing, how do you freeze that fish? We wanted to expand the value added uh, uh, product development and then in, in uh, minimize impacts from low-cost imports. I'm going to show you some of the issues with some of these imports that compete directly against our Great Lakes uh, whitefish. Uh, we look at product form. The restaurants in the North Central region typically purchase frozen rather than fresh fish uh, or fresh seafood uh, products. Uh, if we look at it, frozen seafood products typically account for about 80 percent of the North Central regional restaurant seafood purchase. In contrast, if you look at the East Coast, 75 percent is actually in the fresh food, it's not frozen. So there's a lot of differences when we look at these markets. This was a North Central Regional Aquaculture uh, a project that was conducted years ago. And again, you can see the way this is broken down here where again, uh, frozen is very important in our region. We look at changes in consumer preference. 
And uh, the trends favor major distributors. There's an increase in demand for processed, ready-to-eat products. There's also an aging population that is becoming more health conscious. And you can see Kathy's talks, even some of the new guidelines are telling to eat at least a couple of fish meals per week. More people are getting in tune to that. And again, we look at the structural changes in the industry. There's been a lot of changes, small operations, or years ago we used to just ship a lot of our whole product out. We didn't do a lot of additional processing. We just accepted the low price, didn't do any value added, and boom, it, w it went out. Uh, this is a big corporation up in uh, uh, Manitoba, Lake Winnipeg area, uh, the Freshwater Marketing Board up there. It's a crown corporation, so we compete against that. A lot of people don't realize how much fish comes from just north of us. For some of the f same fish species we take out of the Great Lakes or grow here on a commercial scale. Uh, again, everybody's heard about NAFTA. There's expanding development in these third world cultures. We heard about aquaculture earlier with Emma's talk, with what's happening overseas. Uh, there's greater consumer selection when you go into a store, go into Walmart. You can see all these fish coming from all over parts of the world. There's more fish and seafood imports, and there's growth in domestic and international aquaculture. If we look historically on whitefish prices, we're dictated by supply markets uh, with the majority of fish going into uh, basically New York, Fulton Fish Market, and also Chicago. So you can see that, again, whitefish is a, a lot of it goes into these New York markets. Fulton Fish Market, there's a lot of demand at certain holidays, especially in the Jewish communities out there, for this lake whitefish. A lot of it goes into Acme. They smoke, they're the, probably one of the biggest smokers out on the East Coast where this whitefish moves into those markets. Fulton Fish Market is a, is a big player here. Uh, sh ship fishing from all over the world uh, played a primary uh, role in setting prices for many fish uh, throughout the country. There's a lot of issues how it was controlled. There was, you know, underworld control. I know when Mayor Giuliani there, he tried to clean up the Fulton Fish Market. There was a lot of issues how a lot of this, there was a lot of price fixing going on. So there are a lot of issues there. Then we had 9-11. This is the Fulton fish market right here, and you can see what happened What happened when the biggest part of our fishery goes into the Fulton fish market during the Jewish holidays. That thing came down just down the block from the Fulton fish market, and it affected our industry during that time in 2001. I mean, it just crashed everything because we, be we couldn't move fish out there. So and there's a lot of issues. You can look at what's happened with Russia, with Crimea. This past spring, our price fell just dropped down because a lot of the stuff that uh, used to go into Russia, the Russians kind of shut us down for whitefish imports into their country because of this issue going on with trade and stuff. So a lot of these world events even affect our local fish and where they're going. When Russia says, no, we're not taking any more of your whitefish, you know, then it turns around, goes back in New York, the prices fall. So there's a lot of issues. All these are interrelated. Of course, we have large distributors are capturing every increasing market share. You can look at uh, things like Cisco, Gordon's, a lot of restaurants, a lot of uh, retail stores. They like to buy everything off one truck. It's easier. They got a lot of variety. And so a lot of our fish end up going in that direction. This is Canada's Freshwater Marketing Corporation. It's one of North America's leading fish processors and exporters. This is to the north of us. And they produce a lot of freshwater fish that comes moving down into our markets. And again, if you look at this, it was created in 1969. It was a, it's a crown corporation, meaning it gets a lot of federal support from the, uh, the, the Canadian government. And uh, so again, you can see how it's controlled there. But a lot of their stuff, you can go in there and look this up. It's all on the web. You can look at their finances, how this fish is moving around. So we got a lot of data off their website. So it's all out there in the open so we can take a look at it. And again, this is what your, a lot of our local, uh, I show this to our local processors in Michigan. This is what you're competing against. And uh, so it's a big corporation. And what happens here is you have uh, almost 3,000 fishers harvest fish from 400 lakes in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Northwest Territories, and part of northwestern uh, Ontario. So again, a lot of these big lakes up here where you have whitefish, there's a lot of harvest, and this feeds into this big plant that's located up in uh, Winnipeg. And you can look at this cor uh, corporation, some of the pounds that they produce, uh, you know, you can look here during this time frame, almost uh, over 50 million pounds of fish coming out of that area. 
I mean, this rivals our Great Lakes when you're looking at competition. A lot of people don't look at that. And again, you can look at the sales here, uh, almost uh, 40 million in 1994, and it actually increased to uh, over 65 million in 2003. So, and again, if we look at this compared to, uh, how does it compare to our Great Lakes uh, uh, harvest and stuff like that? If we look at whitefish alone, you can see here, if we look at the Great Lakes whitefish harvest in blue, you can see that uh, in the red there, this is the freshwater marketing board for whitefish. It almost rivals our Great Lakes commercial fishery. And this competes against us. And we see a lot of this fish come floating into the United States here. A lot of our stores like Myers in Michigan, our big chain stores, they always talk how they want to buy local. Well, you go into their store, it's not local. It's all coming from that freshwater marketing board. And they buy for three reasons. Price, price, price. That's what they look at. They look at getting a lower price, and that's what they go after. Let me go back to that. You can see that... Uh, these aboriginal fishermen up in Canada, you can see the high price they get to their fish compared to our Great Lakes fishers. They don't get paid very much. And a lot of this is uh, very low prices for what they, what they move into that operation. Again, this is interesting. We heard about uh, how our fish has moved around. This is, again, another good example here. You can see here that this is actually, they call it a product of China. It came from Canada. It was shipped to China, this white fish, processed there. So it had been frozen on the way over. Fod, processed, shipped these flays on the way back, frozen again. This actually appeared in uh, Jim Thanner from the Great Lakes Indian, Fi he's Indian Fish Wildlife Commission. He bought this in Ashland, Wisconsin. I seen this in Marquette, Michigan, and they were still undercutting our prices. It was at that time, it was $2.99. They still under, all this movement of this fish, well-traveled fish, traveled all over the world, and then it comes back here and beats our price. So you can see there's a lot of, you know, subsidies that go into this stuff when you're dealing with a Crown Corporation. They seen what we were doing in Michigan. We started the flay market in Michigan, pin bone flays. They said, well, that's a good thing to do. We're going to do this now, too. And that's what they got into, and they tried to slip right in underneath us. So, so this is interesting. We do have a regulation. It's by the U.S. Uh, US Department of Agriculture called the Country of Rate Origina Labeling. Cool and uh, country of origination, and they have to actually put on there how it was produced, whether it was wild caught or aquaculture, and then where it was produced or where it was processed. So, and I don't see it's enforced a lot, but it is $10,000 uh, per violation if it's in a retail store that doesn't have that label on there. And these are, they have a list of these. These are special, they call them pack of stores, how much produce they sell in these stores. And these are, Required only for the big retailers across the United States, like your big stores like Kroger's, Myers, I don't know what you have here, Cubs, stuff like that. These are the big retail stores. They have to have those labels on these packages, and it is subject to a $10,000 uh, fine violation if they don't have it on there. Some of the initiatives that this Freshwater Marketing Board doing, they, again, they had these whitefish flays. They were watching what we were doing in Michigan. They did a lot of market development. They did customer-focused workshops. Market research was un undertaken in key markets. They were coming down into the Twin Cities. They were inviting chefs from this region up to their areas. They were trying to encourage these chefs to buy their product, even though we had a lot of Great Lakes product. So they were doing a lot of education. They created new point of sale materials. And again, they developed this processing capacity for uh, this pinball and whitefish. And again, you can see some of the stuff they developed. Uh, and I think your omega-3s are a lot higher than you have in your chart with your fish. You've got to check that out. I think you can double it. Yeah, we need to update it now. Uh, I mean, this matches what we have in Michigan, some of the data we have. And actually, you should actually double it because you have a mo more omega-3s in your fish than you have on your Eat Wisconsin. So you might as well hype it some more because you have twice as much, I think, in reality. And again, this is about the same numbers we have that we use in our Michigan promotion too. And again, this is some of the promo, but they do this with every species they have coming out of those lakes up there, whether it's walleye, pike, they have a unique fact sheets, they educate chefs, they get into how much it's going to cost, how much you can make in the restaurant, so they break everything down, how much money you're going to make off their fish for these restaurants and stuff. And again, you can see where a lot of this goes, this fish, uh, you can see U.S. is a big, where they export to, Small part stays in, uh, in Canada. You can see other countries that are buying this fish is France and Finland. Some goes into Germany, Poland. 
What we did when we had this project, we actually had a, a, a kickoff meeting, a program with the commercial fisheries uh, representatives. Uh, we actually used our, we also have a center at Michigan State that we worked with. And we also worked with a consulting firm, uh, Newhall Klein. And these were the people dealing with Newhall Klein. These were marketing experts. They do a lot of marketing around the country. So we had funds to actually pay to them to come. And what we did, we had participants. What we did with these consultants, we built a, a knowledge map. And you can see a lot of the different fisheries that were represented. I know Mike Parkinson came over to some of our meetings. He's out of Green Bay. He buys fish here in Wisconsin from Michigan. Uh, we also had adding knowledge. We had, uh, again, other people involved with this on the second day. We had even regulators that were involved from the tribes, different governments, the DNR. So we had a lot of different mixes that were involved with, uh, with this project as we kicked it off. And what we did here is we met over a lot of issues. These marketing people kind of took over the meeting. We actually pulled a lot of information out of the, the main players that were involved with the whitefish industry. And what we did is a lot of discussion that happened. A lot of information was put up on the board. A lot of it was rated. And that's where we got into this uh, knowledge map. It was all grouped up. What, were, what was the industry looking for? What are the main things that we should be looking at when we moved ahead with this marketing project? And again, this knowledge map was developed by the industry itself and government representatives. And it represents basically what this group of people knows to be true and current with the industry today. And that's where we wanted to get this information. And again, you can see a lot of the different segments that came out of this knowledge map. And again, a lot of different areas dealing with the different things that we wanted to take a look at. And we found out that there's uh, what needs to be done. There's roles for fisheries. There's roles for processors, distributors, retailers. And what we did uh, with some of this is we wanted to, we got into some sensory analysis for Lake Whitefish. And we used our, we have a sensory analysis lab at Michigan State in our food science department. It's a pretty good food science lab. It's pretty renowned in the United States. And what we want to do is compare Great Lakes Whitefish to Canadian Inland Lake. We want to see what our competitor is doing. How does that, how does that line up to our fish? How does it compare? Then we wanted to compare Great Lakes whitefish, uh, both fresh and frozen. A lot of people say, I don't eat frozen fish. I don't like frozen fish. Well, we work with our industry where we produce a nice product with this frozen. If it's done right, I've done some quality control, quality assurance programs with our people that get into this stuff, where they, how they do it. If they do it properly, it's a, it's a very good product. And then we also wanted to compare the Great Lakes whitefish to other popular fish species, especially aquaculture fish. How does that compare to aquaculture fish? We see a big movement in that area. So those are three things that our industry wanted to take a look at. We moved these projects into our lab. We did different experiments. Again, this is the lab. This is my colleague Chuck Pistis. Him and I worked in the lab with the food science experts. These are blind test areas where we run the product into these windows here. People score it on computers. How do they like it? Uh, and again, we did the, no, uh, when we did the sensory analysis for the fresh fish, we used, again, Lake Winnipeg whitefish against our northern Lake Huron whitefish. And again, you can see this label here that came out of uh, Lake Freshwater Marketing Board, Lake Winnipeg area. Uh, when we looked at the fresh and frozen, we used uh, fresh fish, again, from Lake, northern Lake Huron. We used frozen one month from Lake Superior. We used frozen four months from Lake Superior. So we did these comparisons. And then uh, we looked at other popular fish. We looked at one-month vacuum pack Great Lakes fish, and we compared it against frozen farm-raised U.S. catfish, Chilean Atlantic salmon, and also Chinese tilapia. And again, you can see these samples we did. We didn't add any batters or anything. It was just straight fish, microwaved at a certain time, certain amount of grams we used. And again, the way we did the, the, the top species is if you, you looked at that time when we, when we started putting this together, they rate these every year. You can go to the National Marine Fisheries. This is the top uh, fish species consumed in the U.S. We didn't get into shrimp or that, but you can see salmon, catfish, tilapia were in these top categories. If we look at the retail value, actually salmon, tilapia, and catfish, they kind of fall in there almost every year. Those are the most popular if we look at the retail, how much valuable. And again, you can see the way we did this. Uh, the, the, the frozen samples were in three millimeter vacuum sealed bags. 
These are the standard flays we use. They use them in the restaurant industry in Michigan. Our industry basically packs it like this. It's good for our industry. It's pretty standard in Michigan where we have 30 pound boxes. They're in freezers right now. They can meter it into the restaurant industry or retail stores throughout the winter. And it's a very nice product the way, they, the way it's developed here. And during the freezing process, all the vacuum packed flays were spread out on racks. The freezers were kept at minus 10 to minus 20 Fahrenheit. Uh, again, you can see we had 15 gram samples. All fish were cooked in a microwave without any additional seasoning. Again, we had, uh, for the different things, we had 113 panelists for fresh, 115 for frozen, 113 for, uh, for the species comparison. Again, you can see what this looks like. The, the products fed to them through this window, and then they answer a series of questions. They taste it, they rate it. And again, some of the genders of the panelists, you can see male to female. You can see the ethnicity of the different people that were involved. And again, you can see that most of them like to eat fish. That's probably why they showed up to the panel. <laughs> they didn't really get a big fish meal by just 15 grams of sample, but you can see that most of them, people that probably don't like fish aren't gonna show up for this event, you know? <laughs> and then you can see they are fish purchases, you know, over the last one month, past week or once a week. So you can see they, they purchase fish. They're serious purchasers. You can see, again, they're purchasing fresh product, frozen product by far, and then restaurants a big part of it too. And you can see where they purchase usually supermarkets or a restaurant, which falls into what we see here. And then if we looked at the cooked lake whitefish, whitefish appearance, you can see for the Great Lakes, again, our panel over half thought that we were better than the inland lakes from Canada. Some people thought there was no difference, but you could see, uh, again, we rated pretty well against that. We look at texture preference. Again, you can see Great Lakes rated higher than the Canadian product. And if you look at that overall acceptability, again, we can see that we were beating this in the lake product. And these in the lake products, if you look at them, that, this whitefish that comes in the inland lakes, there's a lot of things that can happen in these inland lakes. You get algae growth, you get off flavors in the fish, uh, the way it's handled, it's got to come back into the United States, the way they process it, is it frozen properly? Some of the product, when we were even trying to prepare it for the testing, a lot of it, the flays were actually falling apart. You can see the myotones in the fish. So it didn't hold together as well as our product. So uh, again, if we looked at, if we get into the frozen product now, and you can see that when we look at the overall appearance, you can see that actually the frozen in the, in the frozen four month in whitefish actually beat the fresh. This was statistically significant. I don't know why, but that's the way it showed up. They were actually rating our frozen over our, our fresh. And even in the texture, they rated the frozen over the fresh. And this fish was fresh. I mean, this came out of Lake Huron within 24 hours. We had it FedEx down into that lab. And that was a very fresh fish, but I cannot answer this. But if this, fre if this frozen fish is done properly, you can see a high quality product that's produced. And again, you can see as far as the flavor, no difference in this frozen for four months, one month or fresh. So they couldn't tell the difference. So it's a high quality product. So don't let people say, if you, don't, if you have a frozen fish, if it's handled properly, it can, be, it can do well in the marketplace. And then if we look at, uh, again, the overall acceptability, again, they rated overall, again, the, the frozen and the uh, one month and four month rated higher. If we looked at the species comparisons, uh, if we looked at cooked appearance, you can see the whitefish here was kind of falling right with the tilapia. And uh, so you can see that with the cooked appearance. You can see the salmon was a little bit higher. And again, there was a lot of stuff with color. I think people just see the color of that fish and they automatically say, well, I like that color instead of that white colored fish, you know? I think that had a lot to do with it. The, actually, the texture, again, you can see our texture on whitefish, tilapia and salmon are pretty much the same. We actually rank better than the catfish. You can see the cooked flavor. Again, the whitefish does with these popular fish like tilapia and catfish. Uh, the salmon was a little bit, they rated a little bit higher than the cook flavor than those other three species. Overall acceptability, again, the salmon a little bit higher. But again, you can see that our whitefish, it does just as well as our popular fish that are on the top market anywhere in the United States every year. So it does, it does quite well. Again, this is some statistical stuff. We looked at consumer labels too, how they preference. And we actually found that wild caught Great Lakes rated the highest. 
China, China tilapia was low. We rated higher than the farm raised catfish and the farm salmon. So you can see that they like that wild grit likes on the label. So our rate's pretty high. So if you want to look at putting that on the label, I think it gives a little extra boost to your product for anything coming out of the Great Lakes. Some of the conclusions, the Great Lakes Whitefish commercial fish greeners are using the results to position its product against other uh, competing fisheries, like Inland Lake and Canada compared to Great Lakes. You can use this information for your own whitefish here in Wisconsin. It'll rank out the same. And then the retail stores and restaurants that use Inland Lake Canadian whitefish based solely on price are being informed of the results. We let them know about it. So again, they should be making these decisions based on you know, better quality of our Great Lakes fish compared to the Inland Lake Canada fish. Other things is the stigma that frozen Great Lakes whitefish is inferior to fresh product is dispelled. It actually ranks higher in a lot of these attributes. Great Lakes whitefish compare favorably to top selling retail fish in the marketplace. We do well with these top ranked ones across the United States. And then those who want to see how their fishery product companies in the marketplace can uh, use the type of study presented here to assist with their marketing efforts. So you can use a lot of this stuff not only in Michigan, Wisconsin, any of the Great Lakes. So we also formed a new cooperative. It's called uh, the Legends of the Lakes. We had four businesses that were involved with that. Again, we put together a pretty rigorous quality, quality control, quality assurance program. And again, they do the, these frozen products and they go to higher value retail stores, especially in the Lansing area where they pay a higher price and those flays sell probably for maybe 10 bucks a pound in those stores. And these are, um, you know, customers that like these smaller stores. They go in there, it's kind of a niche market. So that product's been moved into there. And basically what we did is, uh, again, these were eight to 10 ounce pin bone fillets selected by the processor to optimize quality and freshness. Again, some other promotion materials we had for restaurants. We also developed a, a Great Lakes Whitefish website, which promoted a lot of fishing families. People get to see where their fish comes from. They see families on there, the pictures there, where they're located, where they can buy the fish. We also use this guy. Uh, this guy was a popular chef a lot on our PBS station in Michigan, Emmy Award winning television program, Eric Villegas. He did a couple programs for us on Lake Whitefish, promoted our product. Again, we did a lot of these stuff, these objectives. We did the market assessment, management plan. Again, new handling processing techniques, value added, market acceptance, uh, brand labeling, value added, uh, and then also diversifying the harvest. These are some of the things we looked at. Uh, with that, I'll take any questions. I my time's up. But we also took the, the fishermen and the processors into a big uh, show in Schaumburg, Illinois, where 300 chefs from the region get together on a yearly thing. And we actually brought the product down there. Not only the fresh fillets, we hosted a dinner. We had smoked product. We had smoked whitefish sausage. We had whitefish livers, which are a delicacy. You go to Maggie's restaurant up in Ashton, Wisconsin. They sell that for, I don't know, probably $20 a plate. A lot of people don't realize that. Whitefish livers are a delicacy. Uh, the caviar on a whitefish, I think, is number five in the world for caviar. A lot of our product from the eggs that are shipped over into the Scandinavian countries. So, so there's a lot of things we did with this, uh, with this project, which actually increased our dockside value of the fish. So it's been a pretty good project. With that, any questions? Hey, yes. The FDA has, uh, you know, I, I teach seafood HACCP programs in the Great Lakes. The FDA goes to a lot of these bigger firms that do that, but they can't, probably they only look at one to 3% of the product. So a lot of it ships through, but they do, they're supposed to do some spot checks. I can't say they ever spot check this fish at all. Uh, but they do send people and they look at those concentrated zones. But China is a hub for world fish processing. So they are there. They're into these big plants like, you know, Starkist tuna or any of these plants, whether they're in Thailand or over in Africa that are doing this stuff. But again, a lot of it, it's not all looked at very closely. Where can you buy white fish sausage? <laughs> That's a niche market for our folks in Michigan. You, you go to any of our processors in Michigan, I don't know, do you sell it, Dennis, up in? We haul it back. You can buy it from me, actually. 
<laughs> All right. So you get it from our Michigan <laughs> folks. I go there every week. We yeah. haul it back from Bell's Fishery in St. Louis, Michigan. Yeah, Bell's. And everybody's got their own things. You go to the fishery down the road from where he buys it, like Big Stone Bay, they have more of a spicy Cajun one. Right. Everybody's got Phil's and Marquette has more, to me, it's more mild. Everybody's got their own little secret recipes. Put in your wish list. We go to all of them. Yeah. We also developed a Great Lakes Whitefish cookbook, too, which has <coughs> chefs from all over the Great Lakes, from the chef from Mackin Island at the Grand Hotel. We have a famous chef from the Twin Cities. We even have local fishermen with their recipes. And it was actually uh, written up in the New York Times, even, this, this fish book that we have. And that's available, too. We sell it out of our uh, Michigan Sea Grant website. And it's, it's a great... You can do a whitefish recipe every week, have a different recipe for whitefish every week, and go through the whole book, try them all out. It's a great, it's a great book. So. so again, all these things working together help move a lot of our whitefish. And in recent years, we've seen a lot of our people even going into these farmers markets now. And these people go into these towns that have, again, that are pretty well-to-do communities. And we have people hauling our whitefish flays down to these places that are getting like $12, $14 a pound for flays. And people don't even blink an eye on it. These women come with their poodles there and they load up on the flays. And they're down in these rich communities like around Detroit, Bluefield Hills, Birmingham. Price is no object to them. And they, they think it's great that a tribal fisherman comes down from the lakes. Oh, man, I'm buying this right here. There's kind of an image when they see that. You know, they're getting this fresh fish right off the lakes. and. So there's really big markets that have opened up in these farmers markets too, and there's so many of these farmer markets that are taken off now. Have you done any analysis on age demographic? Uh, what's going on with consumers of this product? The only ages that we had there, I think, were in that uh, in that demographic when we did the just the sensory analysis. But no, we haven't looked into that lately. So, that's a good idea. right, it is, yeah. And I think younger people want to eat healthier, too. That's why you see a lot. That's why McDonald's is in trouble right now. If you look at the business channel, I watch a lot of that stuff where McDonald's Corporation, their stock has plummeted. They're trying, I think they think they're going to cure it by serving breakfast all day. But it's the younger people are going to these other restaurants that they, they're more health conscious. I think they're going to Chipotle's till about a couple of months ago. And I, now that's falling through the bottom. So, but there is, there is this consumer awareness that these young people want to eat at, they're, they're, you know, they have this healthier attitude too. But that's a good question. Yeah, I think that's something we should really take a look at. Mm -hmm.